Hi and welcome everybody to another CaliCube Tuesdays. Today's episode is pre-recorded with Winnie Sun. We recorded it just before Christmas and this is going to go out just after Christmas. Welcome Winnie. Thank you. Thank you so much Jason for having me. It's an honor to share this time with you. A quick hello and we're good to go. Welcome to the show Winnie Sun. <laughs> Brilliant, wonderful, and welcome to you. Uh, delightful having you here. We're going to be talking about branding to grow your business, which I love because I'm into brands and I want to definitely grow my business. That would be a delightful thing for me to be able to do in 2022. Now, I always show uh, brand SERPs, so we're going to start off with your brand SERP. That's absolutely lovely with the Twitter boxes at the top. You have your knowledge panel over on the right. Uh, it's got a lovely description. That's very rich, great photos too. You obviously take a great deal of care with the photos that you push out online and Google's really got a grip on it and it's showing the best photos that I have seen with that delightful red top. And at the bottom, we can see you can actually claim the knowledge panel. And I went through to Google Search Console to check how, and it's your, um, your that's your TV show. It and is. It's actually that site that's been recognized as opposed to your own site, which is ranking number one. And what I wanted to point out here is that this is a one pager. It's a really impressive one pager, great branding once again, but you don't need a massive site in order to generate, trigger a knowledge panel and claim it. A one pager is fine. And then I found this and I couldn't resist because that so cool. <laughs> wow. I mean, I watch that and I think, ooh, ooh, that's a proper show. Caddy Cube Tuesdays pales into insignificance when put next to that. So I, I couldn't resist shaming myself. Oh, so, you are so kind. <laughs> right. Lovely to have you here. Um, that was just a bit of fun for me as the brand SERP guy talking about brand SERPs. But you're talking about brands in a more general manner, online and offline. I wanted to start there. A lot of us think only online these days, but you can't do online without offline. And I would assume you can't do offline without sometimes coming online, whether you like it or not. Absolutely. I think that's so true. You know, we need an online presence and we certainly need an offline presence. And I always say like in order to, you know, they always say it's kind of like the chicken and the egg idea of which one do you start with first? And, um, and as you know, I, I love branding. I think it's such an important piece of what we do for a business. But I think on the back end, we got to make sure that our offline business is solid, is reputable, and most importantly, that it's, it's productive, efficient, and, and ideally um, profitable too. Right. Yeah, because I tend to come from an, uh, an aspect of I just think about Google. I actually just had two... Uh, meetings today where all we talked about was Google. And I think uh, as somebody from the SEO community and somebody who's been in the digital marketing community perhaps too long, I forget that there's a whole world out there and branding is much more than just your appearance on Google. I mean, where from, an, uh, let's start with offline. As you said, you've got to be a, a good, solid, reputable business offline. Where does that start and how do you start building it efficiently? So Jason, I think it's a great question. You know, um, when I think about offline, I think about your, you know, your day-to-day -day business and what that reflects to what your customers or your clients say about you when you're not in the room or even when you are in the room. Uh, because those are so those are also very, very important organic relationships. And that's your reputation, right? There's one thing that we see online um, on TV or on social media, and you can have a certain persona, but then what is the end result. If you have a business like I do, a service business or even a retail business, you have goods and things that you're selling, what does your client feel in that experience? And I think we need to spend a lot of time making sure that we are we have we truly have raving fans offline as well as online because I don't think you can do one without the other. And I think the offline is so important because your reputation, um, they, they might love you online, but once they become your client or customer, are they going to still love you as much? And I think we need to spend a lot of effort, uh, focus, and, and, and really researching that. And if the answer is I'm not sure, then that's a great opportunity to make, sh to make sure. Right, yeah. I mean, I, I think kind of think that idea of real life relationships with our clients and our customers is, is actually quite, uh, I don't know, it, it's moving away in my brain, at least. I mean, I think COVID's probably made it worse from that perspective is that we're not face to face quite so much. And the face to face we do tend to have these days, at least in my experience, has been through Zoom or StreamYard. 
And do, do you think that's detaching us from people or the, the people we're trying to work with and impress or, or, or keep on board? You know, she's such a good question. You know, um, I have my television show. We've t- turned it virtual, but a lot, a lot of th- what I do on a day to day basis, nobody actually sees on camera. And that is, like you said, I'm doing Zooms with clients, prospective clients. I did another meeting yesterday. I'll have probably another meeting today. We we do a lot of uh, meetings with prospective or existing clients. And so you might think, well, that's true. There is certain level of detached, right? Like if you're in person, you can serve them coffee or drink and you can like, Mm -hmm. you know, you can reach across the table, you can share statements. But I've been I've been actually very encouraged because the relationships typically you would think when you're meeting a brand new client uh, virtually is not going to be quite the same. It might not be quite as productive. Maybe they won't decide to sign on with you. And I found that to be not the case. In fact, I think now the recipient who's on the other end, you know, your prospective client is now Con, you know, more comfortable and um, used to now doing things virtually. Mm-hmm. And I think it's just in the way that you present the information and that you're mindful that they're not with you. And how can you reach across the screen? I think if you spend a little time with that, it's kind of like when I used to work on the TV show, America's Funniest Home Videos, right? And yeah. that's really when I learned about um, connecting with the audience. This is years ago, but it's still is very relevant today. So that's the piece. If you can learn how to transition your business virtually, it's not even if and when, it's that you really need to. So get to a point where you're able to, because what I've always said is if a business depends on you being face-to-face with someone each and every time for you to have new business, then you've got a really unsustainable business because at some point we're going to need days off you know, for whatever reason, and you still need to be able to generate income during that time. Right. Yeah. Brilliant. Wonderful point. And uh, my next question is kind of, does branding come before selling or does selling then lead to branding or are they both kind of intermixed? I mean, obviously if I sell to somebody and they're a big fan and they push out and they're an advocate for my brand, that's really great branding, but I need to, do I need to brand before? Is that the most powerful can you give me a quick kind of rundown of that? I know that was a very confused question and wasn't even a real question, but I think Jason was a great question. I thought it was a really good question because (laughs) um, uh, actually it it kind of talks a a lot about what I do, you know, um, for those who have, you know, interacted with me on social, you have probably seen through the years. I'm a really big believer in not selling online. Um, I, I lead by education, by sharing knowledge openly and being there for people when they need me and, and lead with kindness. And I think that, you know, if you do that and you do that consistently and you do it organically on, and with on, to, to, authentically, that um, people will trust you and people do business with people they trust, especially in my industry, in the financial industry. You know, you're trusting me with your money, your life savings, your retirement savings. So you're not looking for someone you just met or you walked into the bank and decided to, you know, meet for the first time. You're looking for someone who really earned your trust. And I think um, I think it's really important to think that way is if the more you sell, I think the the less business you'll have unless you know you're strictly into retail business and you sell soda pop for a living and so maybe that's a great way a very efficient way because you're looking just for your pure volume my mm-hmm. business is very different we're very much relationship um, based it's very much a trust base and my clients tend to stay with me multiple generations and they're trusting me with things that really really matter right i just told mm-hmm. a, a client recently yesterday i said you know There's two really important people you need in your life. What I've learned through this journey with my own family and, and, and things like that. The two most important people you need in your life are number one, a medical professional that you trust, right? That you can go to when you have questions. And the second person is that financial person that you can trust. Everybody else is important. No, don't get me wrong. Very, very important to make the world go round and round. But when it really comes down to like the nitty gritty, those are two areas that everybody needs to have um, somewhere that they can go to for trust or just inherently have that, um, that education, you know, built in for themselves. So, yeah, so that that's what I would say. I would say just try to try to tell your story and share and be really honest, and 
And I think the yeah. business you'll find will come to you. Yeah, but I mean, you were talking about people selling soda pop. As, as, but as the person walks past, you smile, that's branding. And if you smile to everybody who goes past, you're doing high volume, but you're branding and you're keeping that brand on message. And it's what you were saying, leaving a kindness, uh, which is a delightful way of putting it. Um, so kind of branding is every interaction you have with every prospect and every client. And you need to make sure that you maintain brand. Now, th that then begs the question is, can you fake that kind of personality brand idea? You know, Chase, that's a good question. I think you can fake temporarily, but I don't think you can you can fake long term. So I think if you if you look at the brands and people who have been doing this for a long time, who you trust and who you know, um, I think it's very authentic. You know, at some point we're all human and your true colors will come out at some point. So instead of trying to be what you think people want, you might as well just get comfortable and share the world who you are. It doesn't mean that you don't have areas where you can fine tune. You know, certainly through the years, I've learned to better present. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I, I've learned to improve um the value that I bring to the audience. How do I you know, say the things right? What, what sort of things people have an interest in? There's always areas where you can get better, but what you can't change is your integrity, um, your integrity and your true spirit, right? If you are, I always say um, branding or, you know, uh, is, or just, you know, marketing is a lot like alcohol. If, if you are, and especially in the financial industry, we find this especially, right? Uh, as someone starts off with us, more money sometimes is sort of like alcohol too, because with more money, the true colors come out. If they weren't a very nice person and they become wealthier, they tend to not just be even crueler. But they were a really good person when they start off and they 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 come into significant wealth, they actually just become nicer people, more giving, more charitable. And I think the same can be said about branding. I think success will just simply um, highlight and really go full force of who you truly are. And, and so I think, you know, for those of you who maybe had bad experience with certain people, uh, not to worry, just focus on yourself, be the best version of yourself that you can be, and everything else will fall into place. And if it doesn't, so be it. It'll be fine. Right. Um, so I'm building my brand. Uh, the question there is, I've started my business. How do I prioritize? I mean, you were saying be the best version of yourself, uh, fine tune who you are, uh, push it out there. How do you prioritize? Because we don't have unlimited minutes, hours in the day, and we don't have unlimited mm -hmm. funds in order to try and move ourselves forwards. So with that limitation in funds and time, how do we prioritize? So you prioritize being really, really, really good at your business, whatever it may be. Be the best that you can be in your business first. Then what you do is you get really smart in making sure that like, um, if you if you focus on one to one marketing, you'll never get anywhere. What you need to do is focus on having uh, various realms of marketing pushing out your content, your information. So even when you're sleeping, you actually have the potential to bring in new business. And so when I first started, I really focused on building social media reach. I also focus on what I call centers of influence, which is key. So when I first moved into this city, I didn't know anybody. I look for the the biggest, most influential people in that, in this area. And I decided to make meetings and find ways to get to know those people. Because in my heart, I knew I was a nice person. I knew I was a good person. And if they met me they and got to know me, they would really like me. So my job was to find those people. And then once you find those people, make sure that you are there for them. You know, every single one of us um, feels insecurities and we all need someone who we can trust and rely on and who's there for us. And if you become that person for whoever it is in your life, and especially these centers of influence, you will have friends for life who uh, talk about you and share you without you even asking. And so that's key. So you do that, but also spend a lot of time helping other people as much as you can. And the right people that you help will in turn help you as well. So, so really focus on, I think the, the pursuit of kindness is what I say. Try to be there for other people without asking for favors. And I think that's key. I think a lot of people ask for things too often. Mm -hmm. I think it's a mistake. I like to wait until they ask when they say, Winnie, how can I help you? I feel like you do so much for me. What can I do for you? At that point, that's when you have um, that permission to ask. 
Right. Okay. So, and and from that perspective, I mean, you were talking about the people in the town where you are, and I don't actually know where you are. Shamefully for me, um, it's okay. In in where, sorry? I'm I'm in Southern California. <laughs> Ooh, how delightful! Very sunny and. Uh, yeah, I've I've only been to California once, and it was up in San Francisco, um, and I don't think I went to that anywhere. That's completely off the point. Uh, <laughs> the point was back to uh, finding these centers of interest. Uh, mm -hmm. What did you call them? Centers of, centers of interest or cent centers of influence? Centers of influence. So, and for that's example, online and offline. Because sorry, you were talking about the town, and that was offline. What about online? Well, I do. I actually am quite. I'm actually an introvert, so I actually do lead with everything online. It's funny. My mom said I, I find everything online, and it's true. But um, what I did is I came to the city, uh, and I went on the website and looked up, you know, um, you know, different publications, and I found the people. I I did search to see who had the most followers in the area, and then I did research on what they did for a living, um, and a little bit about their background or bio, just to see and get a sense if I felt like it would be a good match. You know, sometimes when you read, you get a, you get a sense, oh, wow, this, like, for example, I'm a parent of three children. One of the big centers of influence in my city here, she has three boys. I have three boys, right? And I read about her, and she's like, you know, has this huge blog and I'm like there might be a chance we could be friends right um so I, I figured out a way to meet and and sure enough we actually we have a great relationship we're both um we're both naturally more quiet people but we we connect really well on so many so many levels so that's what you need to do is you you don't start big start small focus on finding five people that you would like to meet do some research on their background, their business, their bio. Try to find ways that you can add value to them before you reach out. Do your research ahead of time. And then realize that not everybody's going to be want to be your friend or has time. It's not to say that they they don't like you. They just don't know you and you don't know what's going on in their lives. And I'm truly believing that during COVID, especially that every single one of us is suffering in our own ways. We just don't know and they're not projecting. So just assume and go with empathy and assume that if it's a no, it's probably just a not now. If they don't respond to you, it's probably they're going through something and, and just move on. And then, you know, once you build that relationship, make sure it's not a one-time relationship. Try to find other ways to think about these people that you care about and find ways to add value to them everywhere that you go. And soon enough, starting at two, three, four, five, we'll slowly build to a hundred, we'll slowly build to a thousand. And at some point you'll see, you know, even on my tweet chat, we average 150 million impressions. Um, per tweet chat, we're the biggest tweet chat on social media. And this was, I haven't checked the, the numbers recently, but that was, you know, just not too long ago. And the core group still is, you know, probably less than 100 people, but oh. the impressions are so large. So you don't need to be friends with a ton of people. It's always going to come down to quality um, over quantity. And here's the thing too, the, they don't have to all be your client to be very, very meaningful to your business. And that's something I think we always have to recognize. Most of the people that I'm connected to on social are not my clients, but they surely have very, very influential for me to get on, to bring in a whole bunch of more other clients. Right, yeah, Anton would love you for that because he's he's really into the idea of helping people, communicating, and don't expect to sell to everybody. Yes. You can actually just hang out with people online or offline without actually needing to sell. And that kind of, the, the next part of this question is we've been talking about branding, and so it's been very much about personal branding, and you've applied it brilliantly to your company because your company is so associated with you. Now, how do you make that leap is basically saying I've got a personal brand and I can leverage that to my company. Then my company becomes its own entity that has its own personality. How do you bridge that gap? So that's a good question. I think, you know, it depends on what type of business you're in. Right? Certain businesses can market the business brand very, very effectively, like an Apple, right? Yeah. My business is really about that personal relationship, people trusting me. So it is about the personal brand. It's not so much about the company. And, um, and you know, uh, our business has been around a really, really long time, which is very unique in our industry too, because we have a very loved brand and our clients love us. And we've been doing, and we've always maintained small. 
That's something that we've done by design. We never wanted to get that big because we wanted to make sure. My my philosophy was is that if we had a client call in and they had to say, they could say, hey, hey, um, blah, 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 my name is Will. And then my someone on my team was like, hey, Will, blah, blah, blah. They would immediately know the name. I felt like if someone called and they said, my name is such and such, and we couldn't tell by their name and their 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 voice, then we had grown too big. And I felt like then we couldn't provide the value that we were well known for. But to answer your question, um, I think, you know, in this day and age, if you're running a small business, you have to have a face to that business because your name isn't so big that it becomes iconic. And at some point you can pull away just like many, you know, leaders have, but I think it's an opportunity. And I'm a very much of an introverted person, a very private person. So it was really hard for me to to, to be comfortable with that. But I think I've learned that, you know, you get to decide on what you want to share and what you don't want to share. And, you know, if you don't become a voice for your business, then your industry becomes a voice for your business. And in the financial industry, that would be very dif uh, difficult for us because, you know, when I was just starting off, Bernie Madoff would have been our voice and the people who took down Lehman Brothers would have been our voice. And I knew in my heart that that was not representative of our business. And therefore I had to stand up and say, okay, I'll do this. I'm going to start talking about what it is that we do and, and sharing the knowledge that we do with our clients on a one-on-one -on -one basis that we knew was very effective. Right. Yeah. I mean, you said multiple things in there that tickled my interest, one of which is sharing your knowledge. And I think some people think, well, I've got to keep my knowledge to myself. But actually, you share the knowledge, you help your community, uh, you help your industry, and the industry will then, from what I understand, and I think I'm terribly, terribly happy about that, your industry becomes a voice for you, which is genius. And the other was iconic. And I was thinking of Steve Jobs, because you mentioned Apple. He became iconic. And therefore, we even with the size of Apple, he grew with it. But as you say, there comes a point, unless you're going to become iconic like Steve Jobs, you're going to have to step away, at which point the company takes on its own personality. And I love the idea the industry speaks for you. It does. So, and think, I mean, I'm, I'm going to jump on that real quick, Jason, is yeah. think about it this way too. Let's just take one moment. If Say same example, Apple, Steve Jobs. We got to know Steve Jobs because of his turtleneck and his speaking and everything. Mm. If Steve Jobs... Um, had decided, okay, you know what? I'm now going to start an electric car company. I'm going to now sell soda pop. You would obviously, you would pivot as well. And you would get excited about that soda pop. So the company, you're still going to love Apple. And that's great. But there's opportunities for there to be two entities within one entity. And it gives you as an entrepreneur so much more bandwidth. I'll give you an example. In addition to the financial industry, I've worked with brands such as Hilton. I've worked with Chase, with Intuit, with Sally Mae, with um, Hyatt, like all these different brands, or Hertz rental cars, you say, all these different brands you wouldn't necessarily think of when you think of my company. But that's what's really interesting and what's a really wonderful opportunity here because as people we're not one dimensional we have different interests and hobbies and loves and who said we had to fit in a box so i always say if people are trying to fit you in a box you should start creating more boxes for yourself to a point that you're happy so you feel like you're able to stretch your creative you know your creative muscles a little bit to see what else is out there for you. Because I think it would be, uh, if, if you limit yourself, you're never gonna reach your full potential. And I personally, I, I feel like that's doing a disservice to yourself. Brilliant, yeah, and I kind of, I think we tend to think of human, of, as human beings, sorry. For example, on my knowledge panel, it says Jason Bernard, musician. I was a musician, I still am a musician, but I'm also a business owner. I'm also a knowledge panel expert and a brand surf expert, and I was a cartoon blue dog. And I've got all these wow. boxes, and it's incredibly difficult for me to actually kind of manage to manage them in terms of what people expect, because people who meet me today think, oh, he's the brand surf guy, and he deals in brand surfs and knowledge panels and figuring out how Google presents brands when you search their name. But there's much more to me than that. And you're saying, you know, be be proud and, and and present it to people and use it as part of your personality, which is going to build your brand and help you bring your build your company. 
Yes, because I would love it. I mean, I love the fact that you're a musician. I love the fact that you sing the beginning. I think you're so memorable and interesting. Also, it makes you more human uh, than just so memorable, uh, despite the fact we're wearing the same clothes and we look the same. You know, we kind of we probably we probably plan a little bit. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> Well, we actually, uh, with the, the graphic designer, chose the, the red color for this, this episode because of your red shirt and my red shirt, and we were hoping you would wear the red shirt, so we're terribly <laughs> pleased. And at the end, we've got a, a real red out, I think we can call it, with Lydia Infanti, but we'll come to that in a moment. Uh, kind of wrap, <laughs> wrapping this up with, um, with the branding, because what I've loved about this conversation is saying, as an individual company owner, Use your own personal brand to drive your company's brand. And I think a lot of us are afraid to do that for fear that the company will then either not represent us or come to represent us to an extent that we then lose our own identity. Um, can you move that forward? I mean, you've, you've built a much bigger business than I have. It doesn't happen or it hasn't happened to you. How do you manage that? So it's not easy. I, I don't do it alone. When I first started, I certainly did do it alone. Um, but I, I have an incredible team. I think uh, for me, I've been grateful. I I I, I had the I have a. I'm very fortunate to keep my relationships in my life for a really long time, right? I've mm -hmm. been married over 20 years. My business partner, not my husband, my business partner and I have been business partners for over 20 years. Most of my team has been with me, you know, so long, like some of them over a decade. Um, so I, I do have a tendency to retain uh, people in my life, relationships, friends, and everyone mm -hmm. for a really long time. And I think that's one of the things that has helped me move forward um, because you need to depend on people who know your brand, who understand you and can pick up things uh, in areas that you're not good at. So I try to find really good people. That's probably my main thing. Find, find a really, really good people to work with and then everything else can be trained and, and gotten used to over time. So it's about taking care of your people, paying them right well, but treating them really, really well. Treat them like family and and trust them to do their job and, and get out of their way. And I know people talk about that all the time, but it's easier to talk about it and it's much harder to do long term. The other thing I would say is, you know, um, although it, it is nice to, you know, do a whole bunch of things, I say uh, one of the things I'm a big believer is is knowing when to say yes. It's important to know know when to say no too. But there's gonna be a lot of opportunities that don't pay you or don't or don't see don't feel like it's really exactly in your you know wheelhouse. But you should try and say yes a little bit more often. I mean, um, I just did a call yesterday with CNBC. I'm doing a talk with them again tomorrow, and they said I'm so glad Winnie that you were actually able to do this. And I, I told them I said. You know, I always try to say yes whenever I can to whatever it is that you reach out to me. And they're like, even at your level, you could totally say no. I'm like, yeah, but you needed somebody. And what makes me different than everybody else that would possibly say yes to you, right? So I might as well say yes if I can do it. And they're like, oh, I'm so grateful. And it, that's how you build. That's how you earn loyalty because you're there for people when they need you, not when it's on your schedule. Sometimes we just have to learn to do that and be a lot more nimble. And I think that's the secret. People say, well, you've built a million dollar, multi-million dollar, you know, financial, like, you know, hmm. thing going on. You've got your TV show, which is now on our TV shows on NASDAQ, on uh, CW San Francisco, Amazon, uh, Fire. Roku, all these different platforms. And I said, well, it, it, it was a lot of yeses along the way and a lot yeah. of just trying to find ways. And don't forget, the only person who's in charge of saying what where you can go or where you can reach your full potential, you're the only one who decides that. So many people through the years have told me, oh, she wasn't good enough. Oh, you don't, you know, you don't have wealthy parents and you don't have wealthy clients. Or so many times people discounted me all through the years. And now look at me, right? It was because I never gave up on myself. And I think that's the key when you're an entrepreneur. There's gonna be so many bad days and you need to find people in your life that can help you talk talk ideas through. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't from like my longtime business accountant of like almost 25 years, my amazing publicist, business manager, my amazing business partner and all my team, you know, all these people, I have bad days too. And I reach out to them and they, and they lift me up and then we just move forward. You need to have, you need to have a team. Um, even if it's, 
if it, even if they're not like your actual, you know, working together team, you need to have people that you can bounce ideas with. But more importantly, you need that emotional support. And it doesn't necessarily need to be your spouse. My husband's incredible. But like, if it was just him, you know, we're also juggling three kids. You need to have other people that you can go to for different specialties that will give you an answer that you trust is going to be the right answer. So you don't spend all your time, you know, trying to figure it out. Brilliant. Wonderful stuff. That's a great conclusion. And I now have uh, Jim Carrey jumping around in my head being nimble. Yes, man. I will be nimble. Yes, man. From now on. And thank you so much. That was a delightful conversation, really informative. And I just wanted to show this because we've gone all out red today. And ne next Yay. year now, this is the last show of the year. So 2021, last show. 2022, we're going to start with Lydia Infanti, and we decided to use red for her episode as well. So we went totally red, and she's going to be talking about SEL gap analysis, digging up the gold, which is a delightful topic, and I'm incredibly interested to hear what she's got to say. More back on my topic in SEO. And Winnie, could you possibly pass the baton from 2021 to 2022? To you, Lydia. Congratulations. Welcome to 2022, my friend. I can't wait to hear what you have to say. SEO is something that I always want to learn more about. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. You get the outro song too. A quick goodbye to end the show. Thank you, Winnie. Cha-cha-cha. <laughs>